don't understand me too quickly is a phrase that Norman Mailer has long been fond of. He has never wanted to be pigeonholed, included, neutralized by easy assimilation. But perhaps we're worried now that we'll understand him too late or not at all. Mailer has always been the most turbulent writer in America. Oddly, he is also the most American in the public and executive sense. The first thing Mailer did for America was fight for it in the Pacific. His war novel, The Naked and the Dead, published in 1948, when Mailer was 25, branded him with impossible expectations. The novel was so good that no one, it seemed until then, had ever seriously addressed extreme emotions and physical states, fear, pain, exhaustion. It was also such a success that it spelt the end of Mailer's private self. From then on, he was condemned doing everything in public, including growing up. After the war came all the other American crucies and crises, subversion, un-American activities in Barbary Shore, decadence and Hollywood illusion in the Deer Park, Vietnam, machine politics, both as observer and participant. He ran for mayor of New York in 1969, the sex war, Gary Gilmore, the murderer who demanded his own death by firing squad, and exemplified the American synergy of violence and mass entertainment. And now comes the colossal harlot's ghost, a 1,200-page secret history of America, or a history of America's secrets, the hidden world of the CIA. The main character, Harry Hubbard, is a minor CIA spook, but through his mentor, Hugh Montague, codenamed Harlot, he is privy to the major operations of the post-war period up to the assassination of Kennedy, most notably Berlin and Cuba. The novel is a summation of all the tensions and contradictions, all the opposites that have obsessed and excited Mailer throughout his career. Patriotism and paranoia, intimacy and publicity, candor and deceit, power and helplessness, not to mention the ruling passions of love and hate. Uh, the the following speech is by uh, one of the characters of my novel, a man named Hugh Montague, who's called Harlot. And uh, I would like to remind the audience that these are his ideas, not necessarily mine. Harlot is speaking. Our real duty is to become the mind of America. I nodded. I had no idea whether I was ready to agree with him, but I nodded. There's absolutely no reason, he said, why the company can't get there. Already, we tap into everything. If good crops are an instrument of foreign policy, then we're obliged to know next year's weather. That same demand comes at us everywhere we look. Finance, media, labor relations, economic production, the thematic consequences of TV. Where's the end to all we can be legitimately interested in? Dwelling in an age of general systems, we are obliged to draw experts from all fields, bankers, psychiatrists, poison specialists, narcs, art experts, public relations people, trade unionists, hooligans, journalists. Do you have a good idea, Harry, how many journalists are in contract to us? Do observe a little hush-hush on that one. Nobody knows how many pipelines we have into good places, how many Pentagon poobahs, commodores, congressmen, professors of assorted think tanks, soil erosion specialists, student leaders, diplomats, corporate lawyers, name it. They all give us input. We're rich in our resources. It seems to me that you can't write a 1,200-page novel about something you hate. Um, it can't be done. But um, people who followed your career and your thinking would perhaps be surprised by the geniality of this book. I mean, you've described it as a comedy of manners, and yet it is about something that you would regard as essentially sinister, the CIA. Well, I, th I think you can find an institution sinister and still uh, like a good many of the people who work there. Uh, I, I, there were people centuries ago who used to find uh, the theater sinister, but they loved particular actors. Uh, these, I think if I, you, you know, knew a great many CIA men personally, I would probably detest a number of them, because I mean, they have everything from ideologues, who I wouldn't particularly like, to thugs, who I certainly wouldn't like, to uh, people in the middle who are damn intelligent. You know, there are any number of academics in the CIA. There are people who are uh, working away every day at it, who, who you know, are reasonably decent people. It, it, uh, it characterizes all of us in the modern world, I think, that we 
end up uh, serving all sorts of uh, institutions that we really don't agree with at all. That doesn't mean that the people in it are, are uh, equally unpleasant. Mm. Uh, and uh, so I had a great deal of fun writing about these people because so many of them are so moral and they're engaged in immoral activity and that did remind me of myself. And uh, so I, I felt close to them, yes. In the preface to your book, you list about 150, 150 books you consulted when you were researching it. How intensive was your research? How much of the seven years was spent in the library? Yeah, um, I probably read about 50 of those books completely, and, you know, studied them intensively. And the others I looked through and glanced through and read in varying degrees of uh, care. The, the main, you, most of those books are, are not really, they don't offer information that you can trust. But you know, after you've been writing for a long time, as you know, uh, you can tell an awful lot about the style of other people, when they're telling the truth and when they're not, mm -hmm. by those ways when we know we're writing well or we're not writing well, and covering a deficiency in ourselves and so forth. And so uh, uh, I felt I could penetrate a lot of the bad books, the dull books, the mediocre books, and get some idea of what was really going on as opposed to what they were talking about. And then there were some books that were very good. And out of it, you know, one had to digest it. The problem is not how many books you read or how uh, how much time it mm -hmm. takes. The digestion takes much, much longer. So uh, it, it, that was one of the reasons the book took seven years, is I really had to master, to, at least at my own level, the, 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 the material. And was it weird during those seven years when history was changing at such a rate, when we were hurrying into a new world and the wall was coming down, as you were writing about Berlin? Um, did that complicate your feelings about the subject matter? No, because it happened slowly and steadily each year. And uh, I'd started with a stance that, uh, that the Cold War was vastly exaggerated. Uh, the Soviet Union was not quite the evil empire it was represented as being. I visited the Soviet Union in 84 before I began this book. And I came back angry at America than I'd ever been. And my feeling at the time, and, and I actually wrote a few pieces about it, was that this, uh, you know, this poor, depressed, abominable third world country is not our enemy. And that, that this, I'd always known that much, but now I really knew it. And, and that this a prodigious scam was being pulled off on the American people. So I started with a, with a large anger. But finally, since my point of view about the so it, what, all, what it meant as things changed was that I was going to get a trade-off. Uh, the book was not going to come through with any crusading zeal. You see, if we were still in the middle of that great Cold War, this book would be a monstrosity to a lot of people. But now the people can read it much more quietly. So I thought, I'm going to lose something large and gain something perhaps equally good, which is people will be able to read the book now without feeling that they, if they enjoy it, they don't have to say to themselves, what's the matter with me? Am I no longer a patriot? You know, I'd like people in the CIA to read this book, because I think finally you want to write for your adversaries as much as for your friends, and, and that in a way you're covering much more when you do that. So I'm, I feel a certain equanimity about it. It, it might be that the book will uh, mean less to certain people, to a good many people, but uh, oh, I, I can live with that. You've, you've always denied the, the label left. You've always said you were, in fact, a left conservative. Yes. Um, although you had very radical phases in your life. Um, and you've always said that you, in fact, despise liberalism. And Well, because liberalism worries me always. It, it strikes me as a uh, cover story for people who are essentially totalitarian. They, they want it their way. They very often have a one, one point in their one they have a single-minded agenda or program. And uh, they tend to exclude all the other possibilities. Uh, the best thing to be said for conservatism, and there are a great many terrible things to say about it, but the best thing to be said about it is they do tend to have a certain appreciation of the world as a whole. And I just, I, I become uneasy when I find people drawing up solutions, which is, of course, one of the vices of the left, to solve difficult problems, because I think they cut out too many of the nuances. So the conservatism the, in, in the left conservatism is my way of reminding myself that you have to deal with everything in context and that uh, a solution that works in one place doesn't work in another. So it's anti-ideology in a way. I, I am very much anti-ideology, yeah. yes. You must be especially alarmed by the, the PC movement, politically correct movement in America. What oh, do you make of that? I, th I think it's a disaster. You, you know, the irony is, of course, that there are great many, not conservatives, but reactionaries, on the right in America who've been politically correct for the last 45 years. And uh, you know you couldn't breathe a word that uh, if it wasn't totally anti-communist, for example. Uh, 